OK, welcome to my talk, uh, How to Program Like a Five-Year-Old in Haskell. Uh, not to disappoint the five-year-old in the audience, it's actually not about programming like a five-year-old, but it is about Haskell, and it is about logic programming. Uh, my name is Jason. I, like the previous speaker, work uh, doing legal AI. Uh, and the reason is we actually work at the same place. So some of the uh, um, uh, kind of gauntlet that, that Jake ran, I, I bear a little bit of the moral responsibility for. So I, I apologize <laughs> publicly for that now. OK, so one of the things that uh, we think a lot about in, in kind of legal AI or legal automation is how to make the problem that's complicated in sort of a bureaucratic sense. In a lot of uh, legal automation isn't, isn't complicated in the, in the way uh, string theory is complicated, but there's just a lot of details to handle. So one uh, unexpected source of inspiration for how to architect code that can handle that um, actually came to me by, by observing uh, five-year-olds and how they program. And as it turns out, I have access to a five-year-old in which to, uh, to run experiments and to get, uh, get observations. So, so I'll share some of that empirical data with you. There we go. So this is my daughter, uh, Penelope, and she's using uh, one of these coding manipulatives. It's, uh, Puzzlets is the name of it. And you can kind of see the different pieces. Let me actually turn on the volume here. Oh, you can actually just hear it here. Uh, she's doing a couple of uh, these different uh, kind of puzzle uh, manipulatives, each one of the pieces corresponds to a certain action that, you know, a character that she's controlling uh, does, right, for going right or going left or sort of modifying their actions. And you'll notice th the puzzle itself kind of constrains what she can do. The pieces only go in a certain way, only certain pieces fit together. Um, in, in a second, there's going to be a little, a little pair programming going on here. Um, <laughs> as it turns out, I think there's, there's good evidence that good pair programming decreases the efficiency for five-year-old programmers. <laughs> it, does, it doesn't actually, it doesn't work very well for them. But um, anyway, what, what, what can we draw from this, right, if anything, about for, uh, for, for programming at some, at some large scale? And the thought was, you know, there's something interesting about the fact that a five-year-old can put together some program. For them, the programming is essentially putting together a puzzle that does something. The puzzle kind of guides what's a valid program, what kind of works and what doesn't, but it's more or less a kind of a trial and error process that ends with, you know, in, in the case of puzzlets, your little sloth character jumping across the screen, gathering coins and getting to the other end. So we're at a functional programming conference, but I'm gonna ask you to indulge me for just a bit and consider a different kind of programming paradigm. We're gonna call it puzzle-oriented programming. And it has it has two core ingredients. The first are puzzle pieces. So puzzle pieces are just kind of discrete units of computation, right? Programs are sort of formed by putting these together in, uh, to, to build larger programs. And the pieces have edges, so they only fit together in certain ways. Now the other core piece you need for puzzle-oriented programming is a five-year-old. So a five-year-old is essentially a metaphor for a mechanism that can explore different combinations. Not all combinations are valid, and not all combinations do the right things, right? You need something with the right inputs and outputs. So how would we go about doing something like this in Haskell, right? There's a mix of what's clearly kind of type uh, level programming, right? You know, pieces fitting together, there's type safety there, and then something that feels like logic programming, right? Something that is, there's a space of different, uh, different possibilities, but um, you know, you have constraints for what, uh, what, what pieces work and what don't. So here's what we're doing. It, it, here's a version of kind of what we're putting together to do this kind of thing in Haskell. A couple of abstractions. So there's probably a lot of different ways to do this, but for us, puzzle pieces are arrows. I'm not going to go into the details for arrows, but essentially you should think of them as a type class that has an input type and an output type, right? So you can think just in terms of functions, but we're interested in kind of more effectful computations here. So the, the, the idea you should have in mind is a Cleasley arrow. So something that takes in a, an input of type A and spits out a B with some side effect, you know, some context that, that's described by a monad of M. Just to make things concrete, you go to the, the GitHub page um, to actually see some of this code. 
But essentially, the, if we, uh, we want to deal with lists of puzzle pieces, and a couple of things are needed to do that. The first is uh, to define you know, what I'm calling an assembly, which is essentially just an arrow where we're wrapping it uh, so that the B and the C types are, are hidden. This kind of allows us to have a list of pieces and assemblies without um, you know, having to deal with heterogeneous lists, which is, are harder to do in Haskell. Uh, and type representatives for essentially what the inputs and output types are. So that's all an assembly is. It's an arrow that's wrapped that has some, uh, some representation for the types. And then a piece is essentially a labeled arrow, right? So sort of uh, something that has an arrow and uh, has a label in it so that you can, you can index them. What are we going to do for the five-year-old? Well, I, I kind of tipped my hand at the beginning, but, but basically five-year-olds are, are paradoxically the logic monad. Right? The idea, and to the extent that there's any big idea in this talk, it's this, is that we can have, instead of the combination being, you know, putting together the pieces being something that the programmer does, this is something that an automated assembly algorithm can do. Right? So you know, functional programmers really like the idea of uh, kind of composable pieces, right? That I can take two things of an A and put them together in some way to make a different type of A. It's elegant and it's simple and it makes for great code. This is going a step further and saying, you know what? It's so easy that a five-year-old could do it. It's so easy that we could actually write a program that does it automatically. So that's, a, that's, a, that's essentially the idea, right, of the, the, the Using something, uh, you can use any kind of backtracking monad, which is essentially just a method to, to search this space, to put together all the puzzle pieces uh, that, you, that you want without, as a programmer, having to do all the wiring yourself. So the algorithm itself, uh, the algorithm is, you can see a simplified version in the, the GitHub repository. I want to give a hand wavy version of it right now because we don't have quite enough time to, to go into the details. But there's a couple of insights that are important. First is to understand that an arrow um, can be viewed from, uh, as just a, a, a certain kind of binary tree structure. Right? So um, this notation, if you've seen arrows in Haskell, essentially says you have a couple of different pieces. Right? An F1 that goes from an A to a B, an F2 that goes from A to a C, an F3 that goes from that tuple to a D, you know, and so on and so forth. You can compose those, fan them out, and then kind of sequence them. And that, uh, that sequence that you see on the left can be represented graphically as a tree, or combinatorially as a tree. So the idea is it, that's our end goal, right? We're trying to find a particular tree that does the thing that we want, maybe has the right inputs and outputs and satisfies some other constraints. The assembly process is essentially a search over the entire space of valid binary trees to find the one that we want, right? This is what my five-year-old's doing. My five-year-old's looking over all the different combinations that make sense for the puzzle pieces until she finds the one that works. So just to, to you know, avoid confusion, but what that means is a point in that space is, not, is essentially a whole tree. The space we're talking about is some larger combinatorial space, the, the space of all these kind of trees that make sense. Um, here's some code. I, I, I won't go into the details. We don't necessarily have a lot of time. I'll just point out uh, a couple of things about the type signatures to give you a flavor of how this works. Essentially, there's two main functions here that, that matter. The five-year-old function, which is you create an arrow given a particular input type signature. So uh, essentially, this is you know, asking my daughter to, to make some program that starts with a particular type and then run five-year-old, where she's going to you know, call that recursively uh, until she finds something that has the correct input type and the, and the correct output type. Um, and she gets a set of pieces, right? a set of puzzle pieces uh, with which to, to be able to, to create that. So at the end of the day, you may, have, you may find zero solutions, you may find one solution, you may find a whole list of solutions. And depending on the application, that, that may, um, you know, there may be situations where all those things are useful to know. Okay, so as I said before, the, the, uh, I work doing AI and legal services. So I want to give you a sense of how we're actually using this in, in practice. Because it came up from um, struggling with this kind of death by a thousand cuts problem that, I, that we face and that I think a lot of other programmers uh, in other industries face as well, where 
the details are not individually complicated. It's only when you have lots of finicky logic that you have to maintain that things become hard to, um, hard to debug or, or hard to change if somebody comes and gives you some, some new kind of constraints. So I want to give you a sense of how we're using this in practice and maybe how you know, this idea might be useful in other domains. OK, so, so one of the, uh, the things that we're doing that's, that's maybe at first blush less interesting is, is templating. So we have some declarative templating language where, for instance, we'd like to uh, be able to kind of pre-generate an email that goes from, um, that, that's your favorite attorney, uh, or it could be other Fs depending on how you feel about, about lawyers, and, uh, and it defines whatever the, the names are or the docket numbers, but it doesn't, you know, it's templated, right? What we want is to be able to generate that automatically when we get an input from the outside world, right? Let's say the USPTO sends some notification that a trademark for LambdaConf has now been approved, that application is approved, and here's your, your relevant data. We want to send that information out automatically, fill in this, this template. How, how difficult can that be, right? It's totally easy. I look for attorney docket number, it's 67890, and I fill it in right there. This is not complicated. But what if it has some other complications? What if the information is not complete, right? What if you get this and, and that, that piece of data is not in there, right? The USPTO doesn't tell you because they have a variety of different ways of talking to you. What if it's incorrect, right? What if somebody typed something in? What if the algorithms, the parsing algorithms, or let's say you're doing some more fancy natural language processing, what if it fails, right? What if you want to use the same template with a different input? Now these are details, these are exactly the kinds of details that make humans do these tasks instead of automation. So how do you kind of use the ideas that we just talked about to make it um, easy to, to allow lots of different options for getting this docket number to deal with all of these kind of eventualities? Well, I'll give you a sense of, of kind of how we can go about doing this right now. The idea is essentially to to specify the different ways you can get pieces of information. For instance, you know, you may have a way just to kind of grab that information directly from the email, you know, and get the docket number. Maybe that docket number is not there. Maybe the serial number is there. So you have a way to kind of grab that as well. Maybe you have a client reference number and the client which you can grab from that. And you may have other mechanisms, either things that are in a database, things that are on a client portal, that let you take those pieces of information and get the docket number. So we only have to write the stuff that's on the left, all the different pieces. And if somebody comes along and says, you know what, um, you know, there's a new client portal. You can, you know, you have a different way to get that piece of information. Or, oh wait, the USPTO is not going to be giving us a serial number anymore. We don't need to include that anymore. You can modify the, this kind of list of different um, puzzle pieces very easily. What you get for free by the five-year-old, aka the auto assembly, is all the different ways to put those things together. So, so it's a win in terms of, of not just ease for initial implementation, but also a huge win for, um, uh, for kind of maintenance as the system gets more and more complicated. So with that, I will say thanks and take any questions. Questions? Uh, yes, yeah, so, so that's, what, that's what you declare at the beginning, right? You know, if there's, for this example, um, correctness just meant it took the right inputs to the right outputs. And anything that did that would work. So you'll choose a sample size. So, well, you may have a whole list. I mean, in the case, there's different situations. One where maybe you just want one way to do it. In the example I showed you, we actually wanted a whole list. And we're just going to march down that list until we exhaust it. Um, but, but it's the types that, that give you one way to specify what correct means. You could declare other ways. And in your search algorithm, if uh, you, know, you have other constraints you'd like to add to it, that's, that's fine. It, the, the sort of system works as well. It's just you need to sort of bake that in in a particular way. Does that, that make sense? Th there's a lot of um, sort of specific new types that you would want to define in this setting, right? So it's not everything's text. It doesn't work if everything's like text or ints. You need to actually use new types to give some semantic information to it just to, uh, to make it work better. So do you have issues with scaling with the various combinations? 
pollination. Uh, if one choice comes before another, that the pruning is more efficient or whatnot, and how do you deal with that? So right now, in practice, we, we don't. <laughs> um, I, that's certainly, a, in the extreme case, a scaling issue with this, right? It's potentially a really large space, the space of all kind of binary trees. You can do it in a smart way so that you can do pruning early and do it where you're not sort of re repeating um, uh, variants of the same uh, construction. But for, for our situation, there are enough combinations that it makes it painful to do and maintain for, for us as programmers, but not so many that it's like combin uh, you know, combinatorially explosive to sort of go through all the different options. But, but you're absolutely right that that's, that's a concern as this thing scales up. There is some limit to it where you have to do fancier things. And right now we're not doing those. Those are, those are possible to do, but that's, that's outside of this. Yeah. Uh, 